Last Sunday in Pastor's Bible study, you would have been asked to respond to this statement from our Light on the Lessons Bible study. Congregations and church bodies do a lot of planning and projecting in a very rational manner. What we need, though, is less reason and more spirit. As you can imagine, some folks agreed, some folks didn't. But listen again to the statement for the false alternatives it proposes. Congregations and church bodies do a lot of planning and projecting in a very rational manner. What we need, though, is less reason and more spirit. The author of those Bible studies purposefully always gives us loaded statements and questions like that to cause conversation. See, too often people fall for the trap he seeks to expose in the statement. They stumble into that empty dichotomy of spirit versus reason. Again, once more, that statement was, what we need, though, is less reason and more spirit. See, they think the Holy Spirit is unreasonable, irrational, incomprehensible. They think the Spirit is some sort of possessive, enrapturing force that defies reason and accountability, all of which is unbiblical. And at best, it's silly and juvenile. At worst, it's opposed to faithfulness. Now, your pink study and share inserts can take you a little deeper here later in the week, especially questions one and six about the work of the Holy Spirit. In question four, we'll get into that speaking of the tongues, right? You can Google uh, the charlatans that are, the fakers that are named there in that question later. But what I want you to see for yourself is that the Holy Spirit is not the force from Star Wars. The Spirit is not the emotion of uninhibited singing. Instead, you can read for yourself what we learn in Martin Luther's little instruction manual for Christians, his large and small catechisms, right? If you need one, tell me. i got plenty of them. Especially this that we, many of us had to memorize from the small catechism. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith, even as He calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In which Christian church He forgives daily and richly all sins to me and all believers, and on the last day will raise me up and all the dead, and will give to me and all believers in Christ everlasting life. This is most certainly true. Indeed, this is who, not what, who the Holy Spirit is in a nutshell. And that excellent little summary from Martin Luther points us to the mission of the church. As I quoted my friend, Pastor Ed Peterman, recently, and again, he's number five on your pink study and share inserts. God's church doesn't have a mission God's mission has a church. That is to say, God does not corral us in here so that we can think of ways to be helpful to Him. Right? We know how that goes when our children or grandchildren invent ways to be helpful for mommy and daddy, right? My friend David, he uh, one time was, this guy I used to work with, right? He was one time, he's out, I don't know, working on something out in the garage, had the hammer out. His daughter came and took another hammer and proceeded to nail things into the, uh, into the landscape timber. Seemed harmless enough until David went to go look for his drill bits. And she had hammered all of them flush <laughs> with landscape timber. I help you, Daddy. I help you. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. No, that's not how it works. God has work to be done. And so he rounds us up to do it wherever we are in everyday life. See, during this preaching series, Forged by the Spirit, we've considered how the resurrection gives rise to the church. And this happens because the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, and empowers us for God's mission of telling the world about Jesus and the forgiveness, new life, and salvation He brings from that very first historical Easter all the way to today and beyond. And we spread this good news wherever we go in our everyday lives. We don't have to go someplace fancy or exotic. The places of everyday life are the mission field. We don't do this alone. 
Because we know Jesus is with us. He's with us in his beloved, believing, baptized body of Christ. He's with us in his word. He's with us in his sacraments. And thank goodness he is. Because the world is going to reject his message and his messengers. Right? Even in, in our country, as we face oncoming, actual, widespread persecution for the first time. And even then, no matter the suffering we face, even suffering all the way to death, you know that death is the gate, the gate to eternal life. But in the meantime, one of our biggest challenges is just learn to get along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Learn to love them just as God has already loved us, sharing the fruit of the Spirit with them. And all of this is so that we can raise up the next generation of disciples, developing fully devoted followers of Jesus to be here after us. And what makes all of this possible for us is what we just read from the small catechism a moment ago, the reception of the Holy Spirit into our everyday lives. But how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit in your everyday life? Now, last century, that became an existential question designed to introduce doubt, not encouragement, into the lives of believers. And of course, those people had something to sell you to uh, alleviate your doubts. For a donation, they would unlock the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now look, there's plenty of uptight Christians in our culture who would do well to be shaken loose by the Holy Spirit to take their faith more seriously and more deliberately. I still don't answer our question as to how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit empowering you for mission? Is it because you've rolled around on the floor and barked like a dog? Is it because you felt free to lift your hands up during a song or a prayer? It's probably worth doing. Is it because you felt enraptured or motivated by a sermon or a Bible study? It's worthwhile as well. Is it because you've experienced a healing in your life or someone else's following a prayer? I mean, God does make full use of doctors and nurses and our body's amazing ability to heal. Nope. None of those things is how you know beyond a reasonable doubt if you have the Holy Spirit. Consistently, throughout the Bible, when new believers enter into Christianity, and today's story we heard from Acts 2 is no exception, they receive the Holy Spirit with holy baptism. If you're baptized, you have the Holy Spirit poured into your everyday life just like the water was poured over you. The question for you isn't if you have the Holy Spirit, but what are you doing with the Holy Spirit? And my friend, Pastor John, put it this way. The mission of the church, right? All that we've reflected on this Easter season is possible because the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon believers. Indeed, if we were to follow this thread through the entire book of Acts, we'd read each time the Holy Spirit comes upon the new believers. So I suppose it's a bit ironic that we're ending our series about the Holy Spirit at work in God's church with the first story of the Holy Spirit coming upon God's church. But I think that matches our own experience of the Holy Spirit coming upon us in baptism. See, most of us here were baptized as children long before we can think self-reflectively about the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is already at work in our everyday lives. From that moment on, and then later in life, is when we do think and reflect on the Holy Spirit's presence in everyday life. If we back up a little bit in the Bible to Mark chapter 13, Jesus tells us something important here. It connects with what we heard in today's gospel. When they bring you to trial and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you're about to say. But whatever is given you at the time, but say whatever is given you at the time, for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And we heard from St. Paul today as well, writing, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. True speech about Jesus comes to us from the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus tells us in John 15, when the spirit of truth comes, he will testify on my behalf. So this all fits what we hear in today's gospel lesson from John 7. Jesus alluding to Isaiah says, 
Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit flows in and then from the everyday lives of believers, of followers of Jesus, like a river of cool, clean, clear, refreshing water. Other people around us see and hear us show and tell about Jesus and their thirst for life <coughs> is quenched. Now, we know by rote, right, by heart, by memory, what makes us so thirsty for life, for true life. It's an unholy trio, sin, death, and the devil that robs us of life. In fact, sometimes it might seem like we say that so often, we forget what it means. It also seems like increasingly we need to convince each other inside the church and the world around us outside the church that sin, death, and the devil do exist. And by death, I mean both physical and spiritual death. People seem to think that we are on the cusp of living forever by uploading ourselves into the cloud with the great AI. I'm not holding my breath. However, I suppose the strongest evidence of that unholy trio is, in fact, RTLs. Right? It's baseball season. We know what RBIs are. But what are RTLs? RTLs are radically transformed lives by the Holy Spirit in holy baptism. Lives that, as the Bible puts it, repent. Right? Lives that course correct and return by the Holy Spirit to God's ways. Lives that stay on God's path in the first place and avoid wandering away. Lives that examine themselves for purity, holiness, and godliness and pursue them every day as they develop into fully devoted followers of Jesus. That is the church on mission propelled and sustained by the Holy Spirit. But perhaps some of that sounds easier said than done. Maybe. But daily prayer and Bible reading, <coughs> weekly worship and giving, regular reading of the small catechism will get you moving, keep you moving, and move you back in the right direction. Repent when needed. It's life with the Holy Spirit. It's not flashy, but it does stand out. It's not complex, but it can be difficult. It's not overly emotional, but it is earnest and grateful. The conversation doesn't begin by analyzing the proper ratio of reason to Holy Spirit. The conversation always begins with Jesus and the new life, the forgiveness and the salvation that he brings. And that conversation, empowered by the Holy Spirit, translates into God's mission that the whole world, and especially the people in your everyday lives, will come to know Jesus and believe in him. Amen.